Welcome everybody to the 17th session of the Global Ocean Oxygen Network webinar series. I am Hil Jacinto and I'll be your moderator for this evening. I'm from the Marine Science Institute, University of the Philippines. The whole Gone team is very happy that you took time to be with us and our incredible speakers this morning, afternoon, and evening. Before we begin, Gon wishes to bring to your attention some announcements. First, the application deadline for the good OARS CLAPC COPAS Summer School on Ocean Deoxygenation and Acidification has been extended to December 15. That's next week. Second, Early registration for Section 11 on ocean deoxygenation at the fifth Effects of Climate Change on the World's Ocean Symposium in Bergen in April 2023 closes on January 15th. There will be links to these in the chat, or you can scan the QR codes if you're interested. Third, the next GONE seminar has not yet been scheduled, but it is planned for mid to late January of 2023. Please stay tuned for registration information when it becomes available. In addition, here are some housekeeping announcements. You as attendees can type your questions into the question box. Use the chat box to share additional information or to discuss any logistical issues. Okay, we we'll begin with Lara Soto from the University of the Philippines, Siliman, who will be followed by Professor Eileen Tan Xiaohui from University Science Malaysia. Both speakers will present for 20 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers. Okay, uh, before I pass you on to Lara, may I just give you a brief introduction to her? Lara is a PhD student at the University of the Philippines, Diliman studying hypoxia in Manila Bay. As part of her dissertation, she is currently focusing on validating a hydrodynamic model of the bay. Okay, I will now pass on the floor to Lara. Lara? Thank you, Dr. Jacinto, and thank you to UNESCO and the Global Oxygen, Ocean Oxygen Network for this opportunity to share our research. So I'll just um, share my screen. Hello everyone, good day. I'm Lara and uh, again, thank you for this opportunity to share our work on um, hypoxia in Manila Bay. So I'll get to it. Okay, so uh, we're here to share with you some insights from our field work, um, some nutrient load studies and hydrodynamic modeling we did for our research on hypoxia or the oxygenation in Manila Bay. So this work was made possible through collaboration with different um, uh, scientists and researchers and uh, especially, uh, specifically Drs. Cinto, Villanoy, Bauman, and Bosen, and then and a myriad others, and then different research institutions, organizations, and the government, and et cetera. So thank you for the help that you did. So, um, our study site in is in Manila uh, is in the Western Pacific uh, region. Um, it is located in the Philippines or Manila Bay. It's in the biggest island located north of the um, general north of the arch archipelago. It's a major um, economic. Um, uh, it's a major area for economic activity because the capital is there and it drains a the bay drains a watershed home to about thirty eight million people. It's quite densely populated with very poor sewage connections. Most are just um, septic tanks and not a lot of people are um, on pipe sewage and the treatment is really just up to secondary treatment. So in numbers, the bay is about 190, the coastline of the bay is about 190 kilometers. The surface area is 1,800 square kilometers. The average depth is 17 meters, it's quite shallow. 
um, the approximate volume is about 30 cubic kilometers and the, the bay itself receives about 3,000 millimeters per year um, of annual average rainfall. Uh, it also translates to about 25 cubic kilometers per year of total freshwater runoff from the from I think 21 uh, rivers, but 11 about 11 is are the is the number for major rivers. The bay drains a total of about 17,000 square kilometers um, of a watershed. So for the field surveys that we did, we occupied about 31 stations for um, six surveys during the wet and dry season for uh, three years. So the bay is not without um, environmental challenges. Uh, other studies have seen pollution, hypoxia, and nutrification in the bay with the near bottom dissolved oxygen falling to less than three milligrams per liter and the occurrence of elevated nutrient concentrations at river mouths. Um, they've also found decreasing oxygen values from 1995 to 2000. So for, these are from several studies. They've also found or observed um, harmful algal blooms in the area and persistent red tides. The presence of pyridinium bloom, which is a, um, the red tide causing phytoplankton, it was seen from 1988 until 1999, causing several um, poisoning cases and deaths. There was also um, the presence of the phytoplankton noctiluca scintillans, which is, a, which is characteristic of eutrophied ecosystems, and it was found to dominate the, the phytoplankton community in the bay in all sites during um, 2006. So uh, just to give you an overview of what I'll be sharing, um, we'll go through the status or what we found um, in terms of the oxygenation in the bay, and then some insight into the nutrient sources from the watershed, and then a bit of our the results from our hard hydrodynamic and water quality modeling studies. Um, and then we'll share a bit about the ongoing efforts and updates and next steps. So from our field survey data, we we do see the that stratification, of course, during the wet season. Um, surveys and then to your left you see a salinity profile. The dark red uh, profile is was during August 2012, which was which was a survey done after three days of um, intense. Wait, oh, hold on, just my okay. okay, and then. Um, on the right is our DO profiles for the whole bay for the different surveys that we did. And then you can see that the DO, which have values that are less than five are seen throughout the water column from as shallow as 50, uh, five to up to three meters. There's also occurrence of low, very low DO or, or hypoxic DO less than two for different profiles we've seen throughout the survey. So we found that the stratification um, tends to co-occur with um, very low dissolved oxygen, especially during the wet season surveys. Yeah. Okay, so because um, of the opportunity we've had to survey the bay, um, the whole bay, and then in different seasons and surveys, we did want to answer the question, is the oxygenation in the bay getting worse? And then from uh, profiles that we we took, from the middle of the bay, um, we found the, that the oxycline or the area or the part where the dissolved oxygen decreases very rapidly, it's kind of like a thermocline, it was shoaling through time or shallowing through time. From 2010, it was in about 10 to 12 meters, and then it uh, shallowed to 3 to 7 in 2011, and then 2012, it was about 7 to 12 meters and then in 2019 which isn't in the graph it's about five to eight meters so what does this um, what's the consequence of this shallowing oxycline one is habitat compression which can which may affect your fishes and in one study by Ben Dani et al it was found that the demersal fish biomass of the bay was declining by up to 90 percent from a 90, 1949 baseline study and that there was a shift from demersal to pelagic species 
which um, presumably is because the, the pelagics or pelagic fishes would be able to um, sort of swim away from the area with very bad salt oxygen. Oops, sorry. So we also found from the field survey data that there was lower average baywide bottom dissolved oxygen through time. So this is um, average of the whole bay. Uh, it was found to be below five in the recent years, even during the dry season. And five is the threshold um, that's usually given for uh, fishes to survive. It's also the water quality limit given by our Department of Environmental and DNR Natural Resources. Uh, unfortunately, it was also found to be less than three during the wet season, which is all near hypoxic already. From a 2019 um, survey in the Bay done by Tolentino and Onda in, for their Verde Island passage cruise, um, they did a transect from the mouth, from the head to the mouth of the bay, and then they found that from their data, the DO was less than five per stations in the middle of the bay at 10 to 25 meters depth. And then again, the oxic line was less than 10 or shallower than the previous surveys. In another uh, more recent study looking at DO profiles along the coast from Innova et al., they're looking at the transport of organic pollutants through modeling. Um, from their data, it was observed that the subsurface DO for most stations were below four, um, from two to four meters onwards. And these are stations near Pasig River, which passes through most of uh, Metro Manila, which again, um, is very densely populated with very little to no sewage treatment. So, Aside from the field surveys, we also uh, um, did some nutrient loading studies for sources in uh, from the watershed of Manila Bay, specifically looking at land use and statistics like population, um, fertilizer use, etc. We found that the built up and densely populated areas are near the coast. And again, these have very uh, poor switch connections and treatment. And the agricultural areas are further up north in uh, relatively more flatter terrain, which could mean lower transport of materials and retention and possible retention on land and, and rivers of nutrients upstream. So that could be um, kind of a balance because agricultural uh, land use is quite a big factor or a major source of nutrients as well. Um, and because the nutrients don't transport as much. It could be um, like a, a pro, but unfortunately the domestic sector, which is very near the coast of the bay, is actually the major source of nutrient loading. And uh, with their waste directly, or most of the time just flowing out into the bay. So aside from that, we also have, um, we've also done a bit of hydrodynamic and water quality modeling using Deltares DELF 3D. Uh, the figure on the right is it, the grid that we've done. Um, it's a 16 layer sigma layer model. So that means it's bottom following and the inputs and forcing are from fresh, wa fresh water discharge from 11 major rivers with um, with average discharge amounting to um, 25 cubic kilometers per, per year from monitoring data. There's also dissolved oxygen, biochemical oxygen demand, and ammonium data for those rivers. Um, we also have daily average wind and rainfall from the port area meteorological station and tides from the open boundary facing southwest to the West Philippine Sea. So from that model, Link work that we did for hydrodynamic modeling, um, we did find the formation of stratification. Uh, we found that it forms in about a month and dissipates in approximately 20 days. There was good agreement with the model data shown in purple in, in the in the profile to the to the right with the August 2011 field profiles. So it's it's sort of matched. 
from the model, we also saw that wind action um, promotes mixing. Uh, from the period from July 30 to August 2, there were um, strong, relatively stronger winds recorded in the Met Station. And from a stratified water column in July 29, we found uh, it was uh, the helicline with the helicline between three to eight meters, it was converted to a well mixed water column until about five meters in, in approximately a day, and the helicline deepening to about eight to 12 meters. So, wind action was found to increase or promote mixing or aeration of the water column. And um, just to confirm, or obviously, heavy rainfall does increase stratification because of the increased uh, freshwater discharge. Uh, there was heavy rainfall during a three-day period from 6 to 8 August 2012. And the model showed increased stratification for that period or the period, the period right after with a very wide salinity range for the salinity profile shown from the surface until about 15 meters. So the profiles on the right is just showing the profile um, salinity going from um, July to August in it's a, about every other day, I think. So you can see it's from the well mix due to the wind mixing and then to the increase, increasingly stratified water column during the period of, or after the increased rain. From the water quality modeling part of, of the study that we did, uh, we found that boundary conditions are quite important for water quality in the bay. Um, for this, for the model, we assigned the DO profiles or the dissolved oxygen pro profiles at the boundaries to match the data from the station nearest to the mouth. And then we just set river input uh, or river discharge based on monitoring data for DO, BOD, and ammonium. These are just constant inputs uh, based on discharge as well. So we found that the water quality in terms of dissolved oxygen is improved after a month to a month and a half due to the inflow of water from the boundaries. And we found that even with a discharge that is twice as bad from rivers, it has a minimal effect. So again, the boundary conditions are quite important for improving water quality. So um, these graphs show you uh, a section from the mouth of the bay to the, uh, sorry, from the head of the bay to the mouth of the bay. So, wait, I'll just try to bring up the pointer. It doesn't work. Okay. Sorry. Anyway, so the um, it shows a, a section profile from the mouth to the head of the bay from the head to the mouth of the bay. And then um, at the beginning, there's very low dissolved oxygen because of the, the discharge from the rivers. And then after a while, about a month and a half, it starts to clear up until the, the, the conditions are quite better um, from four to five or five dissolved um, milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen. So aside from um, the boundary condi conditions for water quality modeling, we also saw uh, a consistent feature observed at the field um, in the model as well, which is the buildup of nutrients um, at the eastern side of the bay. So for the graphs on the left, um, the four graphs on the left show field data for ammonium, and then the one on the right is model data. So it, it, um, it shows the buildup of higher nutrients at the eastern side of the bay. So this is... Um, this could be significant for the mussel farming in the area, in the Cavite area, or other fish cages and other aquaculture activities in the area. So just to wrap things up, um, there's increased uh, the oxygenation in the bay, especially during the wet season because of stratification. We did find trolling oxic lines, which could um, be, be which could lead to uh, habit, habitat compression. And then through time, the baywide dissolved oxygen, the baywide bottom dissolved oxygen average was below 
five and then it was less than three for the wet season. Um, the nutrient sources from the watershed uh, were mainly from domestic land use, though agriculture is quite um, is a big contributor at, as well. It does not quickly translate because of the the configuration of your your watershed. From the hydrodynamic and water quality modeling, we found from the we were able to see the formation of stratification through time and the buildup of retention areas in the eastern side of the bay. So what does this mean for uh, the oxygenation in Manila Bay? So conditions might be getting worse because of the, the data that we are seeing through time. Um, as with most systems, stratification does aggravate the oxygenation. And we've, we have seen that re-aeration and ventilation is quite important to refresh the water. Um, untreated sewage waste is a likely major contributor to the increasing oxygen demand in the water. And the water from the boundaries facing the open sea helps a great deal to improve the water quality. For ongoing efforts and um, next steps, aside from field surveys and research, there's, there's actually a continuing mandamus by the Sup Supreme Court of the Philippines for the LGUs and stakeholders to clean up the bay. Um, there is a plan to increase the capacity to collect and treat sewage from Manila water. They're trying to build more wastewater facilities. There are actually several reclamation projects in the area, but I'm not very sure if they to have um, sediment transport research with their EIAs, but that would be included, hopefully. Um, in terms of research, there's a lot of improvement for the water quality model to be done. And then as with research, there's always a need to address data gaps, especially with better monitoring data from rivers. And in Manila Bay specifically, there's uh, the role of SGD is, is not yet, um, it, there, we could still research more about the role of SGD, especially at the western side of um, the bay near Bataan. And then there's also pollutant transport and sediment transport studies to be done. With better database, there's a goal of maybe forecasting the O levels in the bay using modeling in the future, and then which could help with rehabilitation work and policies. So uh, these are my references, some of my references. And again, thank you for listening. Uh, maraming salam. Okay. Thank you. And thank you very much, you. Lara, for, for a wonderful um, and succinct uh, putting together of information about the Middle Bay and the work that you have been doing. Um, I'll go straight to the questions. We have a couple that have been posted, uh, and we may not necessarily have time to, for you to answer all, but uh, I'll start with um, the, the first question from uh, Professor Vero Garcon, is there any government measure to reduce drastically the nutrient loads in the bay due to sewage, such as water treatment plants? And I think uh, in part you you responded to that already, uh, that there, there are. Um, you want to comment just very briefly on this? Um, yes, there are some, there are governmental um, policies and measures in place, like number one, the the plan to increase more sewage treatment plants. But I think um, there's even that that mandamus requiring LGUs to sort of monitor and clean up clean up the bay and then bring it up to a certain um, water quality level uh, that's supposedly swimmable for people. But unfortunately, uh, more than the policies in place, it's really the, the political will to, or the implementation of these said policies. That's, that's most of the problem. So there are, some but the implementation is the problem okay thank you um may I move on to the next question from Paul team Paul Lim could you please comment on the diurnal changes of the o over depth profiles in Manila during the algal bloom event is it common to see oxygen supersaturation did you observe high do concentration due to noctiluca blooms um, so for the diurnal changes, unfortunately, we don't have uh, a time series data for, for dissolved oxygen. So we weren't able to sample throughout the day. But I'm, I'm guessing 
maybe with the influx of in, in influx and flow of tides and then the rivers, there could be some diurnal changes in that small time frame. But unfortunately, we're not able to, to look at that. Uh, maybe as we um, check the water quality model, we'll, we'll know more about it in that um, small time frame. I think um, for for the algal bloom event, uh, I'm I can't answer this with confidence because we're not we didn't really look at um, the uh, the relationship of the the O concentration with the Noctiluca bloom counts. But there are several papers. I think from Dr. Azanza and Gary Benico looking at the phytoplankton, phyto, phytoplankton community in the area. So I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not very sure of the answer for this, but um, yeah, there are studies on the phytoplankton community there during the time that we were there. So maybe. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, question from Dr. Ali. Good presentation. Could you please tell me what is the major factor to create hypoxia condition at coast as well as open waters? So in for the system we have in Manila Bay at, at the coast, um, we're seeing that hypoxia or low dissolved oxygen commonly occurs at the, at the time where stratification or freshwater discharge is increased. So that's, that's probably or most likely due to um, the um, less reiteration of the water, meaning the oxygen demand is a bit greater than the rate at which the, the water is overturned or re refreshed or, or um, mixed. So that's one. And, and that's, I think, a bit more significant near the coast for the bay, at least because of the, the proximity to rivers or freshwater discharge, which could create a freshwater lens. And then in op open waters, I guess the the major factor would be um, wind action because it's it's farther from the coast. If there's lots of of disturbance at the surface of the water, it could translate to reiteration. If there's less and and the in the system, it's it's the this the oxygen demand is greater than the rate at which you can reiterate your water. Then that creates your hypoxic or low dissolved oxygen condition. Okay, thank you. I uh, will run to maybe two more questions. Uh, we have two or three minute more minutes left from uh, Professor Garcon. Are you going to use your WQ model to test scenarios of reduced loads of nutrients by domestic use to see if it fixes a hypoxia issue? Uh, yes, we're going to try to do that. Um, so far, we've done uh a an experiment where the the discharge is twice the amount from the rivers and then we're hoping to see what happens if you or how long the dissolved oxygen clears up when you lessen the discharge from the rivers we're aside from that we're also trying to look at the physical um factors affecting hypoxia so so trying to increase the re reiteration rate or, or wind action, et cetera. So, but yes, we're going to try to use that model to test different scenarios. Okay, thank you. Uh, question from Anders Stangberg. Did you measure benthic and pelagic oxygen consumption? What are the values? Uh, no, unfortunately, we're, we weren't able to measure these uh, oxygen consumption values. So for, for much of our research, we're assuming we're just assuming based on, let's say, a certain um, water use. For example, if we know there's not a lot of sewage treatment, there's a certain dissolved oxygen level for that or biochemical oxygen, BOD level for that. So that's what we use in um, our assumptions and models. And, but it would uh, maybe, be good to have that. Yeah, yeah I, I think... Uh... We'll need to move on, but there's a last question, but you finally, perhaps, Lara, you can just answer this online directly to, okay. to Barbara. Right. Okay, so that we can move on to our next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, very good talk and nice Thank response. You. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Uh, may we now uh, proceed and uh, may I ask, uh, yeah, uh, for our next speaker, Professor Eileen Tan Xiaohui, 
is a professor at the University Science Malaysia School of Biological Sciences. She's currently the director of the USM Center for Marine and Coastal Studies. Uh, Professor Eileen's work on marine ecology and invertebrate biology has brought her to address issues related to hypoxia in Malaysian coastal waters. So let us now listen to Eileen uh, share uh, some of her insights and thoughts about the fish kills in Malaysia may be associated with hypoxia. Thank you. Um, Eileen, thank you. please. Yeah, thank you, Gil. Um, very good day to everyone who is present here. Allow me to share my screen. Um, yep. Okay. Right. You can see my screen, right, Gil? Yes, I, I do. I do. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I will be talking a little bit about um, what has happened in Penang, Malaysia, especially in Penang in year 2019. Um, um, let's look at what is, is the whole situation in, in Malaysia. In the top, top right, uh, top left is the Malaysia map to give you some orientation of where we are. Um, uh, we are just, um, uh, Malaysia has, has separated into the peninsula area as well as the um, Borneo side. And, and uh, for the peninsula, let's focus on the peninsula area where we are in the middle of Thailand and Singapore, for those who are not very familiar with uh, Malaysia itself. And I would like to bring your attention to the culture of marine fish. Um, uh, is either, you know, the aquaculture in Malaysia is either in the pond or in the floating net cages, yeah, uh, mainly in the sheltered coastal areas, which occupy an area of 102 hectares hectare and is concentrated mainly in the northern western coast of peninsula Malaysia like the picture like the map shown on the right side uh, on the circle you know most of the aquaculture is focusing mainly on Penang, Kedah and Perak that is three states of in, in Malaysia itself and the species being culture is uh, lettuce called uh, refer, which is the main species cultured, which is the sea bass, which constitute to 81.5% of the total output. Other species being cultured uh, using this system, which is the floating cages, includes the grouper, Epinephalus, Malabaricus, and also the mangrove red snapper, Lutjanus argenti maculatus. So uh, to bring your attention is in 1920, uh, 20, uh, 2017, the aquaculture production in Penang yeah, on the northern side gained the highest wholesale value in the country. Why I'm, I'm emphasizing here because, um, um, uh, because when, when hypoxia happens, it will actually uh, make a drastic impact on all the uh, aquaculture production in the area. Uh, would like to bring your attention also, yeah. Uh, why should we focus on northern Straits of Malacca as as our research site? Yeah, this is the back uh, some background. Um, this area is the largest fishing ground, uh, for Malaysia itself, and also the largest uh coastal population occurs around here, because I would like to like what uh Lara has mentioned. Um, 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 the water quality and, and the occurrence of hypoxia might be related to coastal population in terms of sewage discharge. Yeah? And also, um, the northern stretch of Malacca is also has, is established. It has uh, uh, many established marine reference centers as well as uh, uh, it has good representative of various ecosystems besides being the second largest um, uh, GDP. Yeah? Uh, for, for the country itself. And I would like to bring your attention also, this area uh, is vulnerability of the coastal area to the climate change is expected to impact Malaysia's strategic uh, sectors. Yeah? And then um, the work here, we are focusing on the northern streets of Malacca because it will be a good site to, to, uh, to predict the upcoming changes to this area with the respect to the changing climate. Because when we talk about hypoxia, I would not want to just focus on hypoxia because uh, many times um, uh, uh, whatever happened in the environment or, or, or impact towards the marine organism, it is a combination of multi-stresses. Yeah? 
So for most for the area here that we are focusing, most climate change research we carry out in Malaysia um, uh, uh, or were based on the global scale and impacts on the local scale are not accurately quantified at spatial and temporal levels. So it is important for us to know what is actually happening on the ground and not just rely on what is the average value on, on, on climate change on a global scale. So we have chosen the Straits of Malacca as the four, foremost study area because of the following important assets, which is the largest fishing ground, largest coastal population, and it has various representative of ecosystems and, and the health and resilience of the Straits of Malacca is an economic nexus with a high human population and is integral, oh, sorry, integral to the well-being of the nation. So let's let's zoom in now with the report yeah, on the fish kill in Penang, in particularly in year 2019. Um, uh, why I, I focus on 2019? Because uh, for this year, it happens, the frequency of fish kills happening um, uh, in most of the areas in Malaysia is, is, is very high. If you look at this, this um, uh, map, yeah, uh, showing that the occurrences, the fish kill incidents in the peninsula Malaysia, just for year 2019, yeah, um, you can see on all those indicators in the red dot, those are aquaculture areas. Areas, um, uh, the frequency that has happened, for example, Teluk Pahang in Penang, uh, it happens two times, which is in mid of April to June and, and also in August. And then uh, in Perak, um, uh, also on the northern side of but uh, west coast of Peninsula Malaysia, it happened to August. Pay, pay a little a bit attention on the months that has happened. Yeah? It mainly focusing, is mainly occurring uh, occurred on, in August, April, August, throughout to October. So on the east, on the on the east on the east coast of Peninsular Malaysia, which is the Kelantan, Trungganu, there's also happened uh, fish kills happened, uh, which is also around the period of March, July, September, uh, uh, August and September. So you can see that. Throughout the whole peninsula Malaysia, occurrences of fish kills um, uh, is, is very high. And, and um, um, the question is, is all this related to hypoxia? Yeah. So let's zoom in to what is happening uh, 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 in peninsula Malaysia. I would like to bring your attention also um, uh, for peninsula Malaysia, we are subject to the northeast monsoon, which happens in October, March, where, where um, uh, um, um, uh, rain, yeah? lots of rains which we brought in uh, from the northern side, northeast. And then we have also from April to September, where we are experiencing the southwest monsoon, where a lot of rainfall um, uh, and also drastic wind and, and, and uh, strong wave is happening on the west coast of the peninsula Malaysia. And if you look at the map, um, the, 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 the graph next on the right shows um, um, the sea surface temperature from May to from May um, in, 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 in terms of jet, uh, average year, from May to December, end of December. You can see the higher sea surface temperature occurring from August to October and November. So reflects your, uh, uh, based on this, this uh, it might have some correlation yeah, uh, due to um, the increase in sea surface temperature. And I would like to bring your attention to Penang. Yeah? The first fish kill occurred is, was in April 2019, uh, where fish breeders in the area um, uh, located on the north, which is, which is the Teluk Bahang, um, 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 uh, aquaculturists yeah? in, during that time, they experienced mass mortality. And during that time, you know, uh, in the area that is, that is actually six, six operators yeah, are operating in the area, which is relatively shallow. But then um, um, uh, this area 
is located within a national park, yeah, within a national park, which is supposedly to be a pristine area. However, um, in April 2019, um, there is uh, massive fish kills which occurs and it has actually impacted two of the operators out of six uh, aquaculturists there. And, and based on the observation on site, yeah, based on the observation on site, the color of the water is either dark brown or brackish, and it has, gives out a lot strong smell of hydrogen sulfide. Lots of sea foam were observed in the, on the surface. And of course, a lot of dead fish uh, been, 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 uh, been experienced, been um, uh, uh, harvested, uh, not harvested, or, or been detected in the fish, uh, fish cages. Yeah? And clear filtered water, uh, because our marine center is just next to this area, we, have, we will filter our water. And then when we mix, um, uh, add a drop of chlorox, um, it immediately turned into bluish, greenish, or yellowish, indicating there is chemical reaction with heavy, um, uh, there's most probably uh, the presence of heavy metal. So um, based on the observation on site, what would be the possible cause on, uh, um, uh, that ties to the observation? If we were to look into the water quality, uh, we have detected low dissolved oxygen um, during the, 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 the fish kills uh, duration. And of course, we also detected high uh, amount of heavy metal in the water and also high, uh, high concentration of ammonia and phosphate. And in terms of phytoplankton, um, uh, whether is there any harmful algae bloom or, 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 or other blooms, we find that there is high density of plankton in water and assisting assistance of potential HAB species are most, uh, and then um, uh, the, the plankton, high concentration of plankton are found in the gills and stomach of the dead fishes. And in, uh, we have a team also looking into um, the diseases. Are uh, these fish kills mainly caused by diseases or just um, because of the, of the plankton bloom or, or, or bad or low water quality? So we, we found that um, uh, it's low in parasites, the multiple infections by bacteria and very, uh, vibrio species and no iridoris, uh, uh, iridovirus. So it was concluded that that's the death was actually not due to, to diseases. Yeah? So but then um, for the phytoplankton, um, we have also monitored from March, June to July. We find that there's a shift in algae composition or, or, or um, uh, we're not certain whether it's considered a bloom or not, but we find in terms of species algae composition, there's a shift. Yeah? In March 2019, relative, it was relatively high diversity of phytoplankton in genus composition. There's various of, of composition, uh, Skeletonema, Ketoceros, Coskino, Discus, Navicula, Cinema, uh, cinema and also dinoflagellates. But then comes June 2019. There's a reduction of species diversity. So mostly what we found was largely the centric diatom, Coskino discus and thalassiosira. And comes July 2019, we only found there's a single species bloom, which is only Coskino discus. Yeah. Okay, what has actually caused the shift in phytoplankton composition? So it's a very high abundance in larger diatoms, which is the Koskino discus species, causes increase in organic pollution and nutrient enrichment. So therefore, maybe there's a reduction in nitrate and increase in phosphate. But then the question we, we, we post up is what are actually causing the change? Is it the increase in nutrients or is it species adaptation? Yeah. So we put that. But then um, uh, during the, the, the fish kill in, in April throughout June, um, the bottleneck is there's no definite answer for the fish kill, which happened from April to June 1920 because basically we do not have baseline data. That's why we cannot have much comparison and also we do not have long-term monitoring. 
But all this information, you know, um, we have we work closely together with um, uh, um, our, our department of fisheries as well as NAFISH. NAFISH is a group that is working on fish diseases. Plus all this, this would be this, all this information is actually important for the aquaculture industry and also tourism uh, on the northern part of peninsular Malaysia. So again, comes um, the first fish queue was reported in April until June. You know, it's continuously, that fish was continuously dying throughout those months. But then we have another peak of fish queues reoccurred in August 2019. This is some press release, yeah. On, on, on the fish kill and, and um, the fish breeders were, were, were extremely stressed and the upset. And for this this time, um, um, the earlier incident which is occurring from April to June, only uh, uh, two that is seriously been impact out of the six aquaculturists that is operating in the area. But for this second attack in, in August 2019, uh, all the six aquaculturists is experiencing fish kills at, at that time. Yeah. So in the evening, some some uh, uh, timeline. Yeah. In the evening of tenth August, fish aquaculturists from Teluk Pahang, which is located within the 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 national park, has alerted the marine center about the massive fish kills. Yeah. Which is the second time of such incident since April to June. And, and um, the Marine Centre, CMAX, immediately alert the state government as well as the state director yeah, of Department of Fisheries. Uh, both, both the agencies and also CMAX has immediately mobilised the team to collect samples, both water and, and fish, on the 11th of August. And, and um, like I mentioned, it has impacted all the six aquaculturists and mortality also was observed in the wild fishes outside the culture cage, cages. And to note, yeah, to note here, which is very important, on the night of the 9th of August, Penang was hit badly by the typhoon Lakima. And Teluk Pahang's area faced strong wave and wind during the passing by of typhoon Lakima around 9 p.m. to pick midnight on the 9th of August, yeah? So this is just a, 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 a sample uh, uh, on, on the data that we have collected, mainly on just on the dissolved oxygen at different depths, yeah? From zero to seven kilometer uh, of, of different depths and also from the distance from the shoreline. Um, the area that, that the, the aquaculturists are culturing are relatively uh, shallow, yeah? Are relatively shallow. And, and um, if you look here, you can see um, uh, the y-axis, the, y, the x-axis is the distance from shoreline. Yeah, this distance from shoreline and the y-axis is on the depth. You can see that uh, low dissolved oxygen has been detected even on the day three of um, uh, uh, the fish kill after after day three of the fish kill. And, and after when we continue to monitor, uh, on a daily basis, on day 11, we find that um, the DO uh, level um, um, slowly turning back into ambient or, or more um, uh, normal kind of uh, dissolved oxygen level. And of course, um, uh, about nearly a month later, uh, we could get a very, very uh, consistent kind of dissolved oxygen in the area. Yeah. And for the phytoplankton observation, the phytoplankton was predominantly uh, by the centric diatom and some uh, pennant diatom. Yeah, uh, you can see in the in the in the diagram. No, no known harmful or, or ichthyotoxic dinoflagellates or rapidophytes species were observed in the samples collected on 13 August, yeah, which is three days after the, the fish kill. Phytoplankton samples were also observed uh, under the um, um, uh, uh, light microscope. We have been continuous uh, uh, monitoring the phytoplankton uh, distribution and diversity uh, throughout the whole month after the incident. And, and what we have concluded here, yeah, um, uh, what is happening if you look at the, the flow on the left side, yeah, either is deoxygenation or hypoxia. We need, you know, when we are experiencing so frequent happenings of 
fish kills, yeah. Um, uh, it has impacted uh, aquaculturists and and aquaculturists are um, um desperately crying for help, yeah, by uh hoping that the scientists as well as the policy makers can step in um to address the issues of fish uh, fish kills. And of course, fish kill of concern because affecting the economy of the country and the area that we are culturing um, uh, um, that, that happens for the fish kill are areas that is producing, contributing um, um, to the high um, um, uh, source uh, of economy for, for, for Malaysia itself, not only just Penang. And then we are looking into solution oriented long term monitoring, which is needed that, uh, uh, desperately to determine the cause and sources leading to hypoxia, to quantify the sources, for example, nutrients. And of course, we will have to look into capacity building, networking, and partnership. What we face, the constraint here is convincing the policymakers and the funders. Um, uh, you know, many times the scientists wish. Uh, bring the matter up to to the policymakers. Um, that their questions is always how much do you need, how long do you need, is it uh, uh cost effective, what is the cost return? So um, the scientists um uh, um are struggling, you know, um to convince and also to educate the policymakers in 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 supporting um the work on 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 um, um uh, hypoxia monitoring or even deoxygenation monitoring issues with government also we are facing uh, especially in the case in malaysia we have different uh governance yeah um, uh, federal government and also the local government and of course um, um um the whole situation when we're pertaining to environment we have different ministries or different um, local agencies that are handling for example, the environment have their own uh, ministry, the fisheries have their own ministry, and of course, also the housing and town planning also have their own 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 department to 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 play a role, and all this in in Malaysia is is handled by different uh, agencies, and they have actually separate out. Um, um, their areas of governance. But when it comes to pollution, whether be it the sewage pollution, be it the, the lack of um, uh, um, uh, nutrient pollution, um, um, it doesn't has boundary. Yeah. So um, that's why we need to have commitments of um, a localized monitoring program. Yeah. And if bring your attention also, um, when we talk about hypoxia, it's not just about um, the discharge or, 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 or not having enough oxygen, we have to go into the root cause of what what has um, uh, what is the main cause of, of um, uh, uh, the water become uh, lack of oxygen. Um, if you look at the map shown, Peninsular Malaysia, we are actually in an area uh, subject to a lot of volume of fresh water going into Straits of Malacca. Uh, not only from Peninsular Malaysia, but also from Sumatra itself. That that actually gives a lot of um, impact yeah, uh, in terms of rainwater, uh, river discharge, and also the fluctuation in salinity. And of course, if you look at the temperature, it also ranges um, and, um, uh, in the Straits of Malacca. So the Straits of Malacca is a very good um, uh, natural refuge into to study um, the impacts yeah, of in a natural environment. And of course, in conclusion, we believe that there is an important research for the nation giving the impact when we talk about um, uh, it sh we should not just address it as, as hypoxia, we should address it on a ho more holistic way, uh, in, in, uh, um, incorporating in um, other elements of climate change, like uh, what we have meant Look, here, this is just a summary on what is needed yeah, to look at the local changes in the Straits of Balaka, which incorporate in the temperature, sea level rise and the coastline, the pH, and also we need to get in um, uh, multidisciplinary uh, 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 research, collaboration um, and approach, looking into the economic value, like I've uh, earlier mentioned, this uh, Straits of Malacca is, is an area full of um, uh, uh, co economic contribution. So I think um, um, I, I already passed my time. I would like to pass back the floor to, to Gil. Gil, back to you, Gil. Sorry. Thank you very much for your Thank time. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Eileen, for also a, a very interesting look at the situation uh, in Malaysia, particularly in the Straits of Malacca, with respect to the, the problem of fish kills uh, and what you're starting to do or needing to do also in, to address the problem. I'll field a few questions um, that, uh, that have been written up. Uh, the first one is if you want to write, um, if you can just answer briefly the questions in the interest of time. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so, so, so this, this, uh, I think if, I'll ask a question from Vero uh, Garcon. Are you proposing an alert system for hypoxia for stakeholders in order to preserve aquaculture products? Yes, I mean, if um, um, currently the team, the scientists, uh, is looking into convincing the 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 local state, the local government, and also stakeholder. To, to have um, 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 alert systems as well as continuous monitoring uh, to preserve the aquaculture uh, uh, activities in the area because uh, Swiss of Malacca, I've, I've shown, is, is very prone and, and it is a very narrow street. Uh, street. So whatever changes happen, it will, it will have definitely create an impact. Yes, we do. The answer is yes, we are going to do that. Yes. Okay. Or maybe just a follow through from Vero. One could think of a web interface with oxygen levels information with different color codes, safe, in danger of hypoxia or and or crisis. What do you think? A web interface maybe uh, for an alert system. I, I think I think um, um, Gakon, I think that is a very good suggestion. Um, um, we are actually now looking into that. Uh, working together with our our um, um, the scientists from computer science and mathematics to look into how are we going to apply that and 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 make it uh, um, usable uh, by the by the operators themselves. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question um, from Anders. Uh, thank you for your talk. I know about similar mass skills fish kills along the stretch of Vietnam. Do you know if these events are coupled over larger areas? Well, um, like the two cases, the two incidents that I've shared, it happens, um, you know, uh, the cause of it is slightly different. One of it, like, like I've mentioned, the first incidence was only experienced by two of the operators out of six. The second was, was experienced by the six totally the six operators as well as the fish in the wild. So uh, for every incident, there is a different cause of, of what actually happened. That's why the scientists need to zoom in and, and we, cannot, we cannot draw uh, a conclusion. Um, if it's fish kill, it's, it's because of this. You know, every fish kills, I, I believe, has different causes or different impacts that, make, uh, uh, that cause the fish kill. Uh, thank you. Um, another question from Dr. Ali. Um, you have covered almost all aspects of uh, favors could affect uh, fish kill. I think open water cages could be good volume of oxygen due to mixing or, or water. But fish kills may be because of HABs. But you explained that there was no such situation. And finally, we did not get the conclusion that what were the major cause of that fish kill? Did you study the histology of different organs of fishes? Yes, um, um, you know, I did not actually give you the conclusion because what is the message that I want to send across is uh, different fish kills uh, um, uh, is caused by different impacts. The first one is mainly is actually um, 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 it's, it's, it is low due to low oxygen, but also because overstocking by the aquaculturists themselves for the first, first incident. But as for the second incident, because of the typhoon lekima, it has actually stirred up a lot of the nutrients that causes the bloom of algae that starts to clog the gill of the fish. So um, uh, we did, yes, we did do the histology work on the different organs of the fishes. And, and we do get different conclusion of uh, uh, fish kills in the area. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, one final question. I didn't thank you for explaining this disaster for fish and uh, local communities. Are there any marine reserves where the snow fishing and minimal uh, 
uh, human impacts of MPA. That may be a reference for the effect of fishing elsewhere on food webs and ecosystems. Perhaps such MPA may show effect or if any of seabed trawling and fish farming on oxygen levels. So I, I guess it's a, the, there's a reference area like an MPA versus your fish culture area and yes, how yeah. there might be a difference. Yes, definitely there is. You know, in 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 the MPAs uh, around Malaysia, of course, there is um, you know, fish agriculture. And like I've shown you in the very beginning, the the, the slides. You know, our in Malaysia, the the fish agriculture is they usually focus in a very concentrated area. That is also one of the cause of frequency happenings of of fish kills. Thank you. Um, I I will um, you may or may not uh, answer this question online, but there's a uh, a query, if you want to write a project for monitoring in an estuary where there is significant diversity, what are the essential activities to be carried out? What are the most important parameters to control? Um, well, it's, it's, it's your call. I mean, we have one or two minutes to go. Thank you. Okay, okay. Well, um, 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 of course, like if I've mentioned, you know, in my, in my second last slide, there is, there is various things that we need to monitor besides the water quality and also the the the, the uh, algae composition, we do also need to look at at um um uh, what are the the basic biodiversity of organisms because if we are just focusing on the fish, um um you know it might be just the species tolerance to to certain level of uh, uh, environmental condition. We need to look at the naturally occurring organisms around the area also, which I feel uh, is 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 also important for us to monitor if we want to know the 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 whole picture of whether it's been impacted by hypoxia or not. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, well, we can run over just a minute or two. One last question. Uh, probably I missed it, but were temperatures well above 20 degrees Celsius? If above 30 degrees, I think dissolved oxygen is very low. And if high productivity, then oxygen will be very low at night when there is no photosynthetic release of oxygen. Your comment? Yes, I, I think, uh, uh, Mark, you're you're right that you know, um, at, at our temperature, you know, thirty. Of course, at night the the temperature is lower, but we're still experiencing lower oxygen level at night. That is why in most of the aquaculturist area, um, um, they would they would actually have uh, ongoing. Uh, additional uh, aeration being pumped into even even on the floating cages, but um, uh, if there's a, a a signal of of extremely low oxygen, then um, uh, um, the aquaculturists usually what we do we communicate with them and they would actually um, um, uh, stop their 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 cages at a lower density, so it would it would be less prone to to danger. Okay, I think uh, we've covered pretty much all of the questions. Uh, so thank you very much, Eileen, again, for uh, a very ex excellent talk. And uh, uh, I'm sure there's a lot more to share. Uh, and, and that's why maybe just a plug also, we, we have the Ocean uh, ocean Oxygen Network uh, for Westpac. Uh, many of the issues in, in our region, we need to actually discuss a lot more. So thank you very much. Um, I will now... Uh, share my screen uh, i wish to thank you all for your very active participation i thank the speakers uh Lara and eileen for excellent talks and we we do look forward to your return at the next webinar session uh, in the chat box you'll see links to the summer school opportunity and the ocean deoxygenation session that will happen also next year at the world ocean symposium uh, finally, uh, do keep an eye out for the next webinar announcement. And uh, I think uh, I think we'll end with that. Thank you all, and I, I do wish you a, a very pleasant day or night wherever you are. And uh, for most, uh, happy holidays and a happy new year. All the very best. <laughs>